anywhere in the country. Um, do great work here. Uh, so I, I was seeing signs out by the university with the 50, and I thought at first uh, they were complimenting Tetra Tech on 50 years, and I realized it has to do with the law school here and not us. Um, anyhow, I wanted to, uh, uh, again, acknowledge my uh, co-authors here from Tetra Tech and uh, Ruth Cole from the city of San Diego, who runs uh, a lot of the stormwater department there. Um, and I just want to say right at the outset that if you've got any really deep technical questions for me on some of the statistics and everything else in here that I'll be very kind of glossing over. Uh, I will dodge them uh, for sure. Uh, and that people like uh, Dr. Lei Zhang, who is really the man behind the curtain, uh, I can put you in touch with them. But we'll get to that here. Let's see here. Uh, next slide. So um, I think that most of you know that when you have a biological impairment, the big deal is really trying to figure out what's causing the impairment. And now uh, with, at least in Southern California, with the San Diego Regional Board, um, moving forward on developing bioobjectives, uh, and there's interest in other parts of the state here for sure on, on something like that. Uh, I think that uh, there's uh, quite a lot of um, interest and, and a need for developing more rapid causal assessment techniques. Uh, how many here are familiar with CADIS, DPA's CADIS? Okay, quite a few. All right. Uh, and uh, CADIS is spelled just like the CADIS fly, which is no accident, but it's their causal uh, assessment diagnostic system. Uh, and it, while it's, it's a very comprehensive type system, it, uh, it, it has been very, because of it, it's trying to be comprehensive. It's very sometimes difficult to use, it takes a long time, and uh, you need a lot of data usually to make it work pretty successful. Uh, given our, our history with causal assessments around the country, we have uh, in various places now streamlined this some. Uh, to be a little bit more tailored to the kinds of data we typically have for a site and also for maybe that uh, type of stressors in that region. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing here. We're trying to bring that, um, at least to Southern California for now, uh, to try to make a rapid causal assessment tool. And our hope is that one day this actually can be a web-based tool. Uh, and we'll be working with some other folks, with Squirp and others, to try to see how we can really um, you know, make this uh, a really useful tool for a lot of folks. Uh, so the goal is to develop a user-friendly tool, like I said, a screen sites. Uh, trying to be able to help maybe um, prioritize sites, as I'll say, you know, be able to figure out where should we put our, our bang for the buck kind of thing here. Uh, we also are trying to incorporate the, the, the most current science we have. We've done a lot of work and some of others here uh, on developing tools to help diagnose different stressors. We heard some of this uh, yesterday and today. Uh, and so we've been working with tolerance values and some other kinds of diagnostic tools to be able to use uh, the species data that you have, as well as also looking at multivariate kinds of things, looking at the stressors to try to really bring these together and come up with a better, quicker tool to try to help prioritize at least those kinds of stressors that probably are unlikely to be uh, a cause of the biological impairment you observe. So that's, that's the idea. So I'll be talking about some of these as we go along. And of course, the, the bigger deal here is, is the um, you know, how much data do you have, and that's always the limiting factor with most of these things. Uh, so we're going to try to rapidly rule out uh, stressors that are pretty unlikely to, to be the cause of impairment that you see at the site. Uh, we're trying to include whatever relevant analyses we can, but we are streamlining this. Uh, there are, if you're familiar with CADIS, there are different lines of evidence they talk about. We, our experience has been most many of those lines of evidence. We just simply don't have data for it for most sites, and so we're not looking at those for the most part. We're looking at maybe two or three lines of evidence that typically we can apply in most places, or, or at least try. Uh, and I think these last two bullets are kind of important. I think really the part of the impetus is not just to look at why a site is impaired, but also to be able to look on a scale here with uh, multiple sites when you're looking at this, this sort of thing. Can this tool help um, basically prioritize where restoration or mitigation type efforts that might be best fit. So, for example, a site that has a lot of stressors that are going to be very difficult to deal with or 
they're going to take a lot of uh, effort, expenditures uh, to deal with. Maybe those might be lower priority than some other site, depending on what the stakeholders uh, believe. And then I'd like to say uh, we, we think we can turn this on its head and actually look at vulnerability of sites. So in other words, sites that are not impaired based on what we have learned from the stressors in neighboring sites or sites that are similar uh, to that site you looked at that's impaired, but maybe we can look at those kinds of stressors and see which sites are most vulnerable uh, to those stressors and that currently are not supposedly impaired. So that's another part of this. Uh, our approach uh, does follow uh, basically EPA's CADIS with a lot of, I would say, modifications or refinements. Uh, so you define the case, that's your site basically, for the most part usually. Uh, you're listing the candidate causes, okay, and there we have some tools now I'll show you that we're trying to use here that hopefully will um, really pare down that list of candidate causes. Uh, Evaluating the data. Of course, this is where you're actually looking at some analysis here of the data. And this is where we can bring in some of those other tools I mentioned of tolerance values, uh, species sensitivity distributions, and so forth that we're bringing into this tool to try to help uh, inform which stressors might be likely or not. And then finally, identify the probable causes. So I'm going to go through each of these here. Uh, this basically is a four step thing, uh, and where we are on these right now. Uh, so, the tool components. First off, we require um, data, obviously. We have to have both predictor data, we're calling it. Predictor data is the data that we're going to be using these um, factors uh, that we use to help uh, cluster uh, sites so that we can have basically, uh, and I'll show this, a few clusters that represent different, um, mostly abiotic um, factors uh, that can be helpful in figuring out what your comparator sites are for your test site. Um, and you'll see that much of the factors we're using are the same ones that were used for the CSCI, with some additional ones thrown in uh, from the StreamCat uh, database, the EPA StreamCat database, um, which we found to be maybe helpful here. Uh, we need stressor data, naturally, and uh, that's going to be dependent, of course, on what's been collected for that site. This would be water chemistry, physical habitat kinds of things, uh, and flow, uh, hydro modification or physical modification, anything like that we try, we're certainly interested in. Uh, and with the monitoring that's done here, uh, we often have at least some information on these. Uh, of course, you have your response data. That's the one that we're usually starting with. That's your CSCI score, maybe, or IBIs if it was older. Uh, but we're really drilling down to the tax list here. Uh, so uh, we might use metrics. We rarely will actually use the index itself, probably, but trying to diagnose as much information as we can from the tax list. So, um, you know, this, this is where uh, I think we can we can glean, I think, collectively a lot more tools, frankly, uh, than we have right now. Uh, and then there's the, the support of information. This is uh, your species sensitivity distributions, tolerance values, which we and others have been developing for certain stressors. Um, and then you have these required operations of the tool or this approach we're using, which I already kind of mentioned, but now uh, we're going to get into this a little deeper. Uh, we're using, uh, we're basically clustering um, reaches uh, in this ecosystem region that we're dealing with, uh, which is the coastal uh, Southern California, Zurich region, 85, Eco region 85, and uh, we're going to be, uh, I'll show you how we're, we're, at least so far, we have been clustering uh, sites to figure out groups that would serve as possible comparators for our test sites. Uh, we got to identify the potential stressors from that and then basically analyze it and report it out. Again, this is not, while we can automate this, and we're hoping to do some of that, we're not taking the user out of the equation here. This is not a black box thing we're trying to do here. We're trying to be pretty uh, transparent with, with the process so the user could actually change some things here as they move along and hopefully be informative. So step one is defining the case. That's your target site, typically. Um, it usually uh, will be based on the CSCI score, like I said. Uh, 
and it could be from a reach from a 3 or 3D list. Uh, there's, there's a number of ways, but you have your case at your sites or that you're interested in, in looking at that's impaired. Uh, so the, and you have uh, required data, obviously you need to have the location, and actually we're, by having that location of your site and the reach, we can actually then assign a cluster to that reach, and I'll show you that. At least we think we can. Uh, and then uh, the available stress and biological data gets pulled in for that site. So let's talk about the clustering here, because that's really, frankly, I think that's sort of the meat of this. Um, and it's also, it's the most challenging part of this whole thing. Picking out what you should be comparing your test site to is pretty critical. That's, that's the whole thing of this thing. So uh, what we're using here is the NHD Plus version 2 um, for looking at reaches in, again, this EcoRegion 85, like I mentioned. We're using a StreamCat uh, predictive uh, data. So this is landscape data. Uh, I mentioned here sort of several different kinds of factors, uh, almost all of which I think were included in the CSCI in formulating that. So uh, we're using many of the same factors uh, with some others, uh, additional ones that we think uh, might be useful, at least for this eager region. Um, and then we are also looking at some optional things here. We're actually looking at the land use, land cover uh, information as a possible factor to put into the clustering. Uh, and we're actually looking at with and without. It turns out, in this eco-region anyway, um, there's quite a bit of uh, the correlation there between uh, things like elevation, for example, and urbanization in Southern California. Um, so it, it may not matter, actually, in this particular eco-region whether we put land use, land cover in there or not. Uh, but in some other places, it would matter. So um, we're, we're looking at, at including these other things as part maybe of the factors that determine this classification. Um, thinking that things like urbanization are not going to go away anytime soon, and so that may be just part of the, that's part of the, you know, the landscape. So uh, We have uh, numeric and categorical variables that we're dealing with now here. So the numeric variables uh, could be things like, you know, con uh, contaminant concentrations. They could be, uh, of course, elevation and things like that are, are, are numeric. Um, but these are what we're using in, in a um, principal components analysis uh, to try to figure out how many axes we can really legitimately deal with and explain uh, hopefully as much as 90% of the variance. Um, what we have found so far is that at least for this ecoregion, um, we're trying to deal with uh, not too many clusters so that they're, both, they're distinguishable, but yet we're not, we're not confusing things too much here and having too few sites within a, a, a given cluster. We want to have good representation there so that we can actually have something good to compare with for the uh, test site. So, uh, so far, uh, and I'll show you a little bit, we, we've been hitting on about six clusters, actually. We, we've actually been able to use various factors and come up with what we think are six fairly unique clustering uh, clusters that we can uh, have quite a few sites in each one, so we have a good range of what the various stressor values are for each cluster, and we can basically hopefully use those uh, to compare with for your given site. Uh, there are categorical variables we're talking about are things like rock type, soil type, those sort of things, which are not numerics, and so we have to deal with those a little differently. So the clustering method, now this is where um, I just want to say again, if you have real questions on this, all right, I'm probably not the right one to ask. Um, but uh, I, I can put you in touch with the ones who are. Uh, so we're, we're basically uh, using this a clustering, uh, and we're doing different kinds of clustering, actually. Uh, we're still playing with this, I mean, to figure out what's the best approach um, to actually create these unique uh, clusters that can be used as comparators for this region. Uh, and so we're uh, doing different things depending on whether it's categorical or numeric variables we're talking about. Uh, and actually here you, you can see there's, there's six clusters that we're showing you here. And that has to do with hydrological kinds of groups that we've, we've uh, basically captured with various factors. Uh, you don't need to know all this, but it's just that this is just an example of how we're trying to see that we are being, being able to distinguish various clusters here. Um, 
and I'll just say right off the bat, I mean, we have lots of factors in here. Uh, I think there's, uh, I think we're still up to about maybe 20, 30 factors that go into this clustering. Uh, so whenever you're dealing with that many factors, uh, some may work out great uh, and some may not. It uh, may not be as uh, distinguishable between clusters as others. So I, I think this, still is, this is an area I think in need of still more uh, work collectively here. I mean, should there be a weighting of factors? Should we, should we look at some as more important than others? And that sort of thing. So uh, that's still up for grabs. But in any case, we have used this clustering technique to actually do a map. This is the Eco Region 85, and we've actually used the NHD Plus and so on to actually uh, identify every segment here what cluster it belongs to out of the six clusters we have. Uh, so in theory, I mean, you can actually put your site on the map, and it will tell you what cluster it belongs to. And uh, I'll show you in a second here how that might look when you start looking at uh, the stressors. So step two is to compare now the stressors. So we now have these clusters where, which are based on abiotic factors. Now we're in a position to look at various stressors, water quality stressors, physical habitat stressors, and see how they range within, each, within that cluster. And now you have something to compare your test site to. So that's what we're going to be looking here. And here we, I think is where we can uh, and should uh, incorporate, for example, uh, the flow ecology work, for example, the squirp is was talking about. Um, that, that kind of tool would fit in very nicely here, I think, uh, to help help with that particular kind of stressor. We also have ones for physical modification, using the physical habitat variables that are collected and so on. Uh, so there are other, other things we can bring to bear here. So what we can do, and we have done so far, is for a given test site, we can compare the stressors that have been observed, the, the numeric or categorical things that have been observed at that site compared to what we see in that cluster that it belongs to, supposedly. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, we are still working on the, some of the physical habitat parts of this. Uh, clearly, again, it has to do with how much data is there that we can extract and, and actually show and use. And so uh, we're, we're trying to work with the Seedon folks, for example, to see how things can be pulled out pretty readily. Uh, some of these, especially physical habitat, uh, so that we can really have, a, you know, whatever data has been collected, we, we, we have something to work with there. Um, and then hydro modification and physical habitat modification, again, those are going to be looked at. I, I put up here listed pollutants on the 303D list. Um, that's a, a sort of an optional thing. It, it might, in some cases, provide at least some clues, and so we don't want to discount it. Uh, but it, whether that's actually something that's a, a primary piece of information that remains to be seen. So this is uh, this is the big deal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what you have here, it's going to be hard to read, I'm sure, in the back. Uh, on the, uh, the Y, I guess, Y axis, you might say, it is uh, a list of various factors, mostly stressors. A lot of these are nutrients. Uh, there are some uh, physical habitat um, stressors, like embeddedness, up there. Uh, if you have things like uh, metal concentrations, uh, that would be there. Pyrethroids, that would be there. Anything that for which we have any kind of information would, would actually go as far as these stressors. And what you're seeing, uh, these bars here, I don't know if I can do this or not. Uh, so uh, these bars represent your your range, it's, uh, your fifth and 95th uh, percentiles for that stressor in that cluster. This is cluster three that this particular site we thought belonged to based on abiotic factors. So we have uh, basically these, each of these bars represents the, the uh, fifth and 95th percentiles of what we've seen in that cluster. And again, this is based on at least 25 sites. In most of these clusters, we're dealing with about 40, 50 sites. And that's that's what we're trying for. So again, not too many clusters. <laughs> I, I've uh, circled some areas here uh, just to show you what we mean. The red boxes, the red boxes that you're seeing on this are the site values okay, that we have for that stressor. So for example, for 
turbidity, the red box here, uh, is actually higher than the 95th percentile for, the, for that cluster for turbidity. So that might be a clue that, that, that turbidity might be an issue. Uh, we have things like uh, specific conductivity up here, which is quite a bit higher than the 95th percentile, again, for that cluster based on abiotic factors. And likewise, that we, so, so many of these are, are right in there, so they're not any different. So this, we think, could be a way to at least uh, eliminate certain types of stressors, which apparently are no different than anywhere else uh, and may not be uh, particularly important, but so, that still needs some work. But that's, that's the idea. Uh, we're going to do the stressor response information. Uh, generally, there's two, or th two lines of evidence, maybe, that we're using here uh, because of what we have found in the past in terms of data availability. Uh, so usually stressor response kinds of uh, analyses we would put in here. And this can be done at the cluster level as well as the ecoregion level. Uh, so this is one here where we're looking at, I believe this is for the entire ecoregion. Uh, and we're actually looking at the CSCI, but we're looking at versus phosphorus in this case. Um, but here is where we can uh, actually look at not only this sort of analyses, but this is where we bring in the diagnostic information that we have based on species, um, tolerance values, for example, to conductivity uh, or fine sediments, things that have been developed somewhat for this ecoregion. Uh, and again, this may be able to be expanded, uh, you know, again, more on a statewide basis. And then finally, you have your weight of evidence where you're, you're going to look at the most probable causes. And we're envisioning something like a table like this where it's, it's not, it's going to be basically does it support, refute, or we don't know. Um, but what we think is, based on some piloting that we've done here with a few sites, we think we can narrow this down to, to really relatively few stressors. And then, of course, it's up to the user to figure out whether this makes sense and what other things do they know. Um, so that's what we're hoping we can, we can do. And then the current step is uh, we, we've got the proof of concept done. Uh, we're now kind of basically putting the pieces together and building this tool. And this is where, um, again, we're, we're very interested in working with others uh, to try to see how we can incorporate the best science in this and make this really a useful tool for everybody. Um, and so we're refining some of the types of analyses and how we're bringing in the information in the first place and so forth. So, uh, and I think that's it. So, that's where we're headed.